Um, the bad, um, this mainly constitutes uh, river modification, um, pollution, various forms of pollution, whether that's agricultural pollution or urban, um, and then the threat of invasive species as well, um, and what kind of uh, impact they're having on our, on our river systems. I'll then go on to talk about the recovering nature um, and what this means in terms of restoration ecology and what various people are doing to, to restore our rivers to the to the um, natural states. Um, I'll then go into future threats and um, things that may be an issue in the future. Um, I won't put too much doom and gloom on the situation because there's plenty of that around at the minute. Um, and then finally, I'm going to finish on on why I think um, UK rivers have got a really bright future. Um, and that we should, there's a lot to be very positive about. Um, I'm going to also talk about three potentially controversial things. Um, yes, the Industrial Re Revolution was good, um, but I'm going to argue that it also has an awful lot to answer for uh, in terms of its impact on our rivers, both then and, and the legacy it's had as well. Um, I'm going to convince you that uh, fish live in trees. Uh, bear with me on that one. Uh, and that this man here, uh, Kevin Cosner, um, the Hollywood actor, is actually one of the most influential people in restoration ecology. Um, so I, this is this is me. Uh, this is me as a six-year-old. Um, I was really lucky as a child. Um, I had access to um, open spaces, green spaces, and blue spaces. Um, so my grandparents had a farm in Cheshire. Um, and at the bottom of the farm was a small brook. Um, I knew that there, there were a lot of photos of me in this brook. Um, so I asked my mum to send some photos um, or take some photographs of photos of me in this brook as a child. Um, she sent through about five or six photos. Um, unfortunately, I was naked in all of them. Um, so didn't think it particularly appropriate to use in a talk. Um, thankfully, she did also send this one. Uh, so this isn't at, the, at, the, at my grandparents' farm, um, but as you can see, I, I don't need an excuse to, to get into water. Um, thankfully, nowadays I do wear more clothes when I'm when I'm in rivers and surveying and out and about, or just just at the weekend. Um, so yeah, this is this is where my passion started. Um, access, and I think that's really really important topic. Um, making sure that people have access to it. I think the Peak District is great for that. And I'll, I'll come on to talk about that in a bit. Um, but I just wanted to get across, as, as Rachel said um, in my introduction, that I've, I've always been fascinated with natural history. Um, and it's because I'm doing what I do now because of, I was exposed to it as an early age. Um, and I think that's really, really important. Okay, so what do we think about when we think about a good river? What is good? Um, so this is an illustration that um, a very talented artist did for us called Rachel Hudson um, and we commissioned her to put in a range of species that we thought you know the constitutes I'd, I'd like to see them um, in our rivers and you know there's, there's quite a lot here there's white clawed crayfish there's otter um, there's salmon as you can see it's, it's a meandering river that's connected to its floodplain it's all very nice so this is what we're aiming for really um, still a little bit too neat Rachel Hudson's very good, but it's still very neat. I think wildlife is messy. I quite like that about wildlife. Um, so more, more dead wood around essentially, I think is what, is what I mean by messy. So luckily, when we talk about a good river, we, we don't have, we, we've, we've been told what good is. Um, so this is, this is a, a screenshot from a website um, that the Environment Agency host. Um, it's called the Catchment Data Explorer. Um, it's really, really good if you haven't been on there previously. So it, it gives a classification of um, all the water bodies in um, England um, and it breaks them down into a series of, of, of criteria that are assessed every, every few years. Um, so as an example here, so the river um, from Ashup to Oldport, um, you can see that it's in moderate condition. Um, we have been, well, we've set ourselves a target of getting all rivers to good condition by 2027. Um, as you can see, we still have an awful lot, long way to go, um, looking at the various ecological and, and chemical parameters. Um, but yes, this is a very good website um, for checking out if you want to have a look at your local, local water course, as everyone should. 
Okay, so in Derbyshire, there is no, there's no reason why all our rivers shouldn't be spectacular. We've got so many protected sites. Um, we've got dozens of uh, local, um, of national nature reserves, um, including Dovedale, um, many, many triple SIs like the Y Valley. Um, we're, you know, we're, we're in a national park. Uh, well, a lot of a lot of Derbyshire is is, is in a national park, um, and also the special areas of conservation as well. So whether that's the South Pennine Moors or um, or the Dark Peak, um, I mean, this is you know it's it's European and um, international importance. A lot of us, a lot of our sites, um, and a lot of them are, are rivers and and water based. Um, so there's a lot of good stuff out there already. Um, but unfortunately, my job isn't isn't just going out to the nice bits and going, oh, this is quite nice, uh, and then going home. Um, that's my weekend. Um, but my day to day stuff is normally dealing with the recovering ones. So the various habitats that you can come across in these. Um, I think the more you get into rivers, the more you assign personalities to the rivers. Um, so the one in the in the top right um it's you know an upland an upland stream it's loud it's noisy this would be your your biker i reckon um it's quite abrasive uh, very dynamic but uh, he's probably my favorite um bottom left is the lovely peaceful clear flowing y uh you could think of this as your ballerina in a lovely white dress um, I mean, there's an argument that I've been doing this too long now, um, <laughs> and that I'm obsessing. But it, it, you, you do you do assign them. And bottom right, um, that's the main Derwent um, down in the south of the county. Very slow flowing, um, essentially a man on a deck chair on a Sunday afternoon. All these habitats are really really important. So the bottom the bottom picture in the middle is where it all starts um, in our uplands. Um, and it's a you know it should be it should be a wet environment to hold as much as much water as possible um there's so many different characteristics in derbyshire so starting up in the dark peaks you've got you know the heavy influence of the peat um and the gritstone um and then obviously in the in the white peak as well you've got the limestone so the river the river the rivers are very very different in terms of color um quality you can go you can start off in, in the in the dark peaks in the heavy rain um and see you know almost coffee colored water coming off the uh, coming off the moors and then get to um where the river y meets it and it's it's crystal clear coming from the y um it's beautiful absolutely stunning um and of course you, so the top left picture is uh, one of our reserves it's um willington wetlands and obviously these wetlands also play a really really integral part in um the river system and how they're connected in terms of connected habitat um and water storage as well so there's a there's a huge mosaic here so i've just just referred to the word mosaic i think when you look at a habitat um regardless of what it is really what you want is a good habitat mosaic so you don't want ironically there isn't much of a mosaic in this mosaic um but you what you want in a, in a, in a good habitat is lots of different niches so you want areas of fast flowing water slow flowing water um lots of debris um bankside vegetation you know, all those little habitat niches that can be um utilized by a range range of organisms that's what you're aiming for in a, in a good habitat structure so i'm going to talk a little bit about the species now um i'll start off with the plants um because you know they're, they're the baseline of, of, of everything really and this is this is quite a common one this is um water crowfoot um as a beautiful delicate white flower that you see coming to the top of the water surface um, and normally if you're driving along or walking along and you, you have a look down along the Y or some of the some of the trips of the Y, um, you'll see a lot of this and it's, it's a sign of a really good river essentially. There's lots of um, habitat there for invertebrates, fish to hide in, um, it traps sediment, it stabilises the, um, the substrate at the, at, the, at the bottom. Just lovely. Um, so not only is your submerged vegetation really important, but your bankside vegetation is also incredibly important. Um, that forms some of that green corridor um, that's really important for wildlife to move up and down and give wildlife a lot of cover as well. 
So now on to invertebrates. Um, invertebrates are an incredibly important indicator of the quality of a river. Um, they're essentially the canary in the mine. You can tell so much about the water quality by what invertebrates are there. Um, and also the opposite is true. So um, a lack of invertebrates or certain invertebrates can be big indicators of, of water quality um, and pollution incidents. Um, so you do you get to a stage where you start looking at rivers uh, and streams and brooks and ponds and in your head you're building up a mental picture of what invertebrates you'd expect to see. If you're not seeing them then you can start asking why. So the picture on the left is um, a mayfly, it's called a heptagenid. Um, these require um, fast flowing water, their, their body is very streamlined so they, they stick to the rocks. Um, I was going to say like limpets but they're much better than limpets um, but they're, they're lovely little creatures and again very um, sensitive to, to pollution um, and sediment as well so if you have a sedimented um, environment there they're not happy at all. Um, on the right is a, a example of a cased caddis fly so you can get cased and caseless larvae um, and one of the great things about these is that a lot of the time their cases are species specific so you can tell a lot about um, what the invertebrate is inside by how it makes its its case and they're, they're fascinating they're really good. Two other invertebrates I want to talk about um, so stonefly on the left um, again a sign of really really good water quality if, you, if you've got these in so these tend to be in your in your upland streams um, and also these these are pretty hefty top relatively top predators of your invertebrates as well so um, this little fella um, um, is uh, Dichronotus uh, cephaloides and he's got um, hairy armpits and um, so very easy to ID. Um, you can see in the bottom left of that picture there is a, also a tiny little cased caddis um, who has made his shell out of, who made Kate case out of tiny little grains of sand um, that he stuck together. Um, so that's some of the size difference that you're looking at, at these invertebrates but all of these incredible bioindicators and tell you an awful lot about the river. Um, on the right is our um, native uh, crayfish, the white clawed crayfish, um, protect, European protected species, um, and unfortunately getting increasingly rare um, nationally and across the county. There's a few strongholds that it's really, really important to, um, to protect. Um, and we're also looking at projects at setting up arc sites as well. So these are areas where um, we would look to put new populations of, of crayfish um, away from. Um, any risk of, um, of them dying out. Um, I'll come on to talk about some of the threats to, to them um, in a little bit. Okay, so some of the fish that you might find in our rivers as well. Um, so top left is the brown trout, um, wild brown trout. Um, again, lovely fish, uh, good sign of good water quality. Uh, grayling on the top right um, with its beautiful sail. Um, again, lovely, lovely fish. Will tolerate um, slightly worse water quality, but um, beautiful. Um, I, I'm quite biased. I, I think really good. <laughs> Wonderful as far as fish go. Um, bottom right is uh, the bullhead or Miller's thumb. Again, this is a European protected species. Um, and again, will only tol tolerate good water quality. So if you're finding those in the river, you, you know it's in pretty good spec. Um, Bottom left is one of the three native lampreys that we have in the UK. Um, this is a brook lamprey. So very, very primitive creature, um, has a fixed jaw. So it doesn't have a, doesn't have a, um, a movable jaw uh, and is parasitic on, on other fish. Um, the brook lamprey are non-migratory. So they will stay in our rivers the whole year round. Um, the river and sea lamprey are the other two that we get in the UK. Um, they are migratory. Um, but we don't have, we just have uh, river lamprey in Derbyshire, sea lamprey. There are too many obstacles in the way for sea lamprey to make it this far, essentially. They're not great swimmers. Um, yes, there's a couple of noticeable absences uh, on this slide, but I will come back to why they are absent um, a little bit later on. Um, I'm also a very keen birder. Um, I... Uh, the dipper's, dipper's probably my favourite bird. So the bird on the right is the dipper. Um, they're just so much fun to watch um, going up and down a river. Um, they dive under the water after the invertebrates. So the invertebrates form the base of everything and so many um, fish and birds are reliant on those invertebrates. 
Um, again, dippers will not tolerate bad water quality. Um, so if you've got dippers flying up and down, it's it's a very, very good sign. Um, the other one, just, um, one of the egrets, um, these are becoming increasingly more common um, in the UK and across Derbyshire, which is a really great sign that things are starting to recolonise again. Um, some organisms that you don't really associate or wouldn't normally think about associating with, with rivers. Um, this bat is um, a Dorbenton's bat, and these pretty much exclusively um, forage along rivers and, and watercourses and, and lakes, taking invertebrates off the top. Um, so again, just really, really valuable that those insects are there um, that support all these, all these predators going through. Um, and then onto your mammals. Um, so admittedly, both these, uh, so water ball on the left and otter on the right, they both look like they've been caught doing something that they shouldn't have. Um, this is nonsense. They should be in the county and there should be more of them. Um, water ball, uh, both these species have had a pretty tough time um, for different reasons. Um, water ball through habitat loss and predation from mink um, and otter from um, historic persecution. Having otter in a ecosystem is, is incredibly important. You know, they're top predators, they're apex predators. Um, you need, an, you, you need a, an awful lot of things right in a habitat for them to, to, them to be comfortable. They've got huge ranges um, and I'm very pleased to say that they are expanding across Derbyshire. Um, you know, 20, 30 years ago, they were, they were not in the county, um, but they're, they're coming back now, um, which is really, really good to see. Okay, so that was the good. I'm waiting for time. Okay, um, that was the good. I'm now going to go on to the bad. Um, so this, I'm going to break this down into, into three three parts. So river modification, um, pollution, and invasive non-native species. Um, our rivers, like I said at the start of the talk, our rivers have had a pretty tough time. We have done our best to harness them. Um, we have straightened them to make it easier to farm, make it more convenient for us. Um, we have drained an awful lot of area to get water into our rivers as quick as possible, which again isn't great. Um, there's been a lot of concrete, a lot of sheep piling, a lot of straightening, um, which, which isn't great. So just an ex as an example of this, um, this is Alfreton Brook. Um, so we, this is, goes into the River Amber, um, which is a tributary of, of the Derwent. You can see in the middle, um, just below where it says Alfred and Brook, there is a um, parish boundary. So that grey dotted wiggly line is the parish boundary. Um, when they were originally drawing all these parish boundaries, they would follow the course of, a lot of them would follow the course of, of um, waterways. So you can see here the original course of the waterway. Um, lots of meanders in it. It was m obviously much, much longer then. Um, what's happened since then, is a big open cast coal mine was put through that area um, and then when it's been put back it's been put back as a as a essentially a canal so what that looks like is that photograph on the bottom right as you can see straight as a die um, and by by straightening a river you reduce its length um, which has implications for water storage and flooding as well um, so putting those meanders back in is really really important um, but historically, we, we have tended to straighten them to make things more convenient for us. So um, this is a painting by a guy called George Moreland um, that he did in 1795. And it's called A View of the River Derwent at Belper, Derbyshire, with a salmon and a grayling on the bank. Um, now, I don't know if any of you are anglers or if you can see anything wrong with this um, painting, um, but when I first saw it, I looked at that and thought that's definitely not a grayling. So the salmon at the back, and then the fish at the front, um, they're calling a grayling. I don't think that's a grayling. Um, I think that's a fish called a shad, um, which we have very, very few of in the UK at the minute. Um, they're starting to come back to the River Severn, um, but they are very sensitive to any barriers being put in a river. Um, so that was in 1795. We had two migratory species coming up to Belper. In 1798, um, we built this 
Um, this is one of the weirs at Belper. Uh, it's in a World Heritage Site. Um, so obviously weirs were really, really important for the Industrial Revolution. So it harnessed the power of the rivers, drove the water into the goits um, to power the mills. So an incredibly important part of our industrial heritage. Um, in terms of natural heritage, not great. Um, it's you know the equivalent of putting uh, a brick wall through the M1 and it's still expecting people to be able to commute from Sheffield to London. Um, they're, they're huge, huge issues. Um, so not only is it a physical barrier to migration, but uh, for migratory fish, but it's also a big um, disruptor for coarse fish as well. So fish that wouldn't normally migrate. If you think about fish getting washed over that under high flows, nothing can get back over it. Um, so you're constantly getting a depletion of your uh, upstream waters. It also holds back a lot of the sediment um, and it completely changes the flow regime of the, of the water above it. Um, I am one of the worst people to go on walks with near rivers. Um, I tend to get a sixth sense for weirs coming up because the, the rivers just completely change. They look more like ponds. Um, because they get this, um, they just be, yeah, they become still waters essentially. Um, it traps a lot of the sediment which sits on the on the stones, which makes it, um, sorry, the sediment sits on the um, substrate, which makes it bad for invertebrates and fish. Um, I've got a lot of issues <laughs> with, with weirs. Um, I think they've got an awful lot to answer for. Yes, they're a very important part of our cultural heritage, um, but I think there are things that we can do better to either go around them um, or, or, or make things easier for, for migratory fish. So leading on, to, leading on from the industry section, um, so it wasn't just the, the weirs and the, and the mills that were at issue, it was um, a lot of the mining works uh, and we're, we're still seeing a legacy of this today. Um, so this is one of the um, open cast coal mines in, in Alfreton. So again, on the River Amber, um, and there were, there, you know, there are lots of lots through lots of these through the coal fields. Um, these are now still um, leaching heavy metals associated with with um, this work um, into our rivers. So you know, hundred years on, they're still having huge, huge effects. There's some of the the, the deeper mines that are still being pumped to stop the water. Um, coming up and filling the mines and, and, po and po essentially poisoning aquifers, um, which again is, is terrifying um, and, and, and not ideal. Um, but yeah, we're still, we're still dealing with the legacy of, of these now. Um, another legacy of, of something that isn't, isn't that obvious um, are these SUFs. So SUFs um, would take, would essentially drain the mines and keep them dry. Um, but the stuffs were never really filled in. Um, so when you re well, when you hear stories about things like the River Bradford um, drying up in the in the summer, a lot of it is because the water has just gone into these stuffs. Um, some of the stuffs run underneath the rivers as well, so the the water can just filtrate all the way through the substrate bed um, and into these stuffs. Um, so it completely changes the hydrology of the rivers and how much water there is in the rivers and where it should be going. Um, again, some of these have been designated a World Heritage Site. Um, so they're quite difficult to deal with. Um, but again, it's, it's a legacy of, of what happened 100 years ago. So next, pollution. Um, it's, it's, it's a hot topic at the minute. I mean, it rarely leaves the news, but um, it has been getting a lot of more traction recently. Um, looking at the state of our, our rivers, um, whether they're safe to swim in or not. Um, so pollution can come in in, 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 a, in a couple of different forms. So it can be urban. Um, so from this, you're kind of thinking about misconnections from drains, um, sewage, um, runoff from roads, um, that kind of stuff. So the top right is, is, a, is a picture of um, a misconnection. So that's, you know, household waste coming straight into a river. Um, bottom right um, is an example of a combined sewer overflow. Um, so these are pipes um, that carry both sewage and um, drain water. Um, they're initially in two 
it looks like a, a W shape really. So in one half of the W you've got your sewage and in the other half you've got your um, drain water. Under high flows that comes up and mixes and can get discharged straight into the river. Um, and this is when you see all the, all the sewage related detritus like your wet wipes and all that kind of stuff. Um, and again that's that's still going on there are there are hundreds of those across across the catchments um and again <laughs> quite a big issue um one of the other things about pollution is that it's not always that obvious um so the picture on the left that might look really quite idyllic um it, it, it's polluted with heavy metals um again a remnant from from the from the mining industry um so it's it's not just a case of looking at the water and it's cloudy or there's you know loads of toilet roll hung up in the trees um something can look quite good um but and that's when you start looking at the invertebrates if it's devoid of invertebrates you know there's something there's something wrong with the water quality um so the other one uh, apart from urban is um agricultural um and catchment management is really really important um, so this is a book that I had read to me as a child and I read it to my daughter um, called Each Peach Pear Plum and it is an incredible example of awful awful catchment management. Um, <laughs> again not my awful to go on walks with but I can really suck the fun out of story time. Um, so there's lots of things wrong with this catchment. Um, there is very little vegetation along the rivers um, so not much of that really important habitat that so many um, animals need, animals and birds need. Um, you can see that where they've ploughed the fields, they have ploughed um, down the hill, which increases the amount of water that can um, come off the, 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 um, the hills. It should be ploughing across, across the hills. Um, on the bottom right, you can see there's, the farmer there is allowing access for the cows straight into the river. It's really, really bad. I'll come on to say why that's bad in a bit. Um, but yeah, not, not, it's not very good, this one. So these, these are the major culprits. Um, the farming industry um, have been going through a really, really tough time. Um, and they need as much support as they can. Um, so we tend to try and work with them rather than go through any kind of like environmental um, uh, EA kind of prosecution stage before it gets to like in, uh, agricultural pollution. We want to be able to work with them. Um, so these <laughs> cows are one of the major issues. Um, and this this is why. Um, he looks very pleased with himself, the one that's in the brook. Um, but he's, you know, so this is called poaching. So when cattle or sheep um, are allowed to stamp up the, the river banks, um, or to a point where they're not riverbanks anymore really and this is a major cause of pollution um, and it all adds up you may you may look at that one field and be like well and a lot, we have a lot of the conversations we have with farmers are well it's just one field the point is that all this adds up um, and it washes everything into the water um, so this is an example of how much sediment can get into to rivers um, so this is at Kettleston, Kettleston Hall National Trust property, um, and in their lakes. Their lakes essentially act as huge silt traps, um, which is good for the rest of the river, but not good for the Kettleston estate. Um, but again, it's it's arable farming as well. Um, so um, when farmers plough in the autumn and winter, at these bare fields, um, and sediment runs off that really really quickly. Um, so not only does it bring in the soil particles, it brings in um, phosphate as well that's attached to those soil particles um, and phosphate's really bad for rivers and um, you don't want nutrients in rivers that's when you get issues with algal blooms um, taking out a lot of the oxygen as well so it all adds up um, agricultural and arable pollution so now on to um, invasive species um, so top left is uh, Himalayan balsam. Um, you may recognise this. Um, you'll hear a lot of people say it's good for bees. Um, it's not. If it, it, it's a monoculture, um, it completely dominates a riverbank. If you were to have a natural succession of um, native vegetation on that, it would provide food for bees. 
the entire year, not just a feast or famine. Um, it's essentially like an all-you-can-eat buffet for a month, um, and then it dies back and it's gone. When it dies back, it leaves a very bare bank, um, which also makes it more prone to erosion. Um, so again, having a very detrimental effect. I could have picked another 10 or 12 um, plant invasive species um, to talk about, but there's, there's a lot. Um, and it's difficult to get on top of them. Mink, so the bottom left is mink. Um, <laughs> they've been in the news um, uh, quite recently for spreading coronavirus. Um, I want to get rid of them for different reasons, um, but as long as there's a push to get rid of them, I don't mind if it's coronavirus or their effect on mink, um, I'm sorry, on water bowl or ground nesting birds. Um, Kingfisher, anything like that, they've, they've absolutely come in and, and decimated a lot of our, our native wildlife. On the right hand side um, is a signal crayfish. Um, so these are, in, uh, again, uh, North American invasive species. Um, they got into the country because we thought it was a good idea to farm them as a business, um, to have crayfish meat. Um, that didn't really work. Um, and they found their way into our watercourses and since then have spread hugely throughout the UK. Um, they eat pretty much everything um, and are a serious threat to our own white claw crayfish. Uh, mainly, not, not just because of the, they predate them, but they also carry a disease um, called crayfish plague, which signal crayfish are immune to, um, but our white claw crayfish are incredibly susceptible to. Um, and it can completely wipe out populations. Um, so that's why initially um, initiatives like Check Clean Dry are really, really important to try and stop the spread of, of crayfish plague, to try and protect um, our native white cloud where we can. Okay, so now um, onto the recovering. Um, and basically what I mean by this is, is catchment restoration. It's, um, it's quite naive to look at a river and think we can just fix the river. The river is so reliant on everything around it, so it, it's it's more important to fix the catchment um, than just the river itself. Um, it's 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 all connected and it's all incredibly important. Um, and you have to think of it of landscape scale um, restoration as well, because there's no point focusing on your little bit when it's influenced by you know, whatever's happening to, um, a couple of miles upstream. If there's a sewage treatment works that's just pumping stuff in and, you know, you're trying to do your little bit of gardening down there, then it, it doesn't really work. So river restoration, uh, I thought mussel shell was more appropriate than nutshell. Um, so my job essentially is, um, it can be summarized uh, in the following five points which is quite depressing and convenient at the same time. Um, so what I will do, I'll, I'll go to site and my first thing to do is um, survey it. So what does it look like? Um, so whether that's the morphology of it, the plan form of it, what species it's got in there, where it is in the catchment, gather all that baseline data that, that, that you can then go on. So the second thing to ask is, should it look like that? Um, is it straight? Is there, uh, what man-made things are there? um what's the bank look like all that kind of stuff then the third thing i ask myself is what can i do about it um so this is this is why i really like what i do because it's it's problem solving um and the, there are there are the, there are so many innovative ways that you can look at this as well there's no there's not necessarily a right and wrong way of doing it a lot of them are site specific um so it makes it really good fun um and also the possibility to collaborate as well so once I've asked those three questions, next one is, um, is there money to fix it? So obviously these, you can't just do these things for free. Um, so then we, we go out to uh, look for grants to be able to do this kind of work um, and hopefully get them, which we're, we're, at the trust we're, we're quite successful at. And the last one, which is probably the most important one, is am I allowed to fix it? So it's all very well and good saying that something should be fixed and you know how to do it. But if you've got a landowner that doesn't want it done, then it makes it look much more difficult. Um, or there, there might be other issues um, in terms of if something that you do may um, increase flood risk um, as well. People tend to get quite touchy about that for some reason. Um, so that's, that's my job in terms of river restoration about, about how I go about it. 
and obviously it's not just it's not just as i said before focusing on on the river um there are so many different organizations that need to be involved in this um and this kind of comes together under something called the catchment based approach um which is a way of trying to get all these different organizations um to come together to 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 fix whatever is wrong with the catchment um because it's in everyone's interest so having that joined up approach is really really important um otherwise i think you will be fighting fighting a losing battle so as part of this um all catchments across um england have a catchment partnership so this is a group that facilitates um all these other groups coming together to fix what what issues there are in the catchment um and this is this can come in various forms whether it's um education access invasive species control survey um flood risk and flooding um, habitat restoration Th there's absolutely loads in there um so we host we host the derbyshire derwent catchment partnership at derbyshire wildlife trust um and it's really really important um and having that diverse mix of of people on it as well is is really important um there are so many people out there that care passionately about about the rivers and their water courses and getting them in 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 back into tip-top shape So what does river restoration look like on the ground? Um, so for me, that top right picture is, is one of my favorites. It's um, weir removal. Um, and it makes, it makes an instant impact to a river. So the second you start taking a weir, even if it's a small weir that kids have built up, if you take those stones out, you'll see the water start washing over the stones and cleaning them up, taking that sediment off um, and reconnecting habitat, which is really important. Um, that bottom right is um, an example of um, floodplain connectivity. So one of the other modifications that we've done as, as, um, as a society is disconnect rivers from their floodplain um, because we've wanted to keep them dry. So it's easier to farm them or build, <laughs> um, which is really, really detrimental to our rivers. Um, so reconnecting the floodplain is an incredibly important job. Um, there's other things you can do like re um, um, reforestation um, so whether that is tree planting or um, rewilding so you know al allowing natural regeneration and revegetation of um, steep sided hills or um, the floodplain is really really important and the bottom right is just an example of invasive species control as well so it's making sure that anything that you do in terms of restoration isn't just going to get dominated by invasive species all the time. So it is making sure that you have a handle on that as well. So some of the, some of the agricultural issues um, in terms of cattle are, are really simple to fix. Um, the best thing you can do is just fence off the river. Um, it sounds silly, but um, and it sounds like a pretty quick fix, um, but it, it, it works wonders um it allows the vegetation to, to build up the banks to restore themselves and um really really important um if you have farmers that still want access to the watercourse that's fine you just make it um a little bit more solid underfoot so you don't get all that muddy water and that poaching um that's possible to do or ideally you take the water source and you pop it somewhere else um and farm if you can find grants to do that then farmers are normally pretty willing to do it So in terms of the urban environment, there's loads of things you can do to stop um, water getting into rivers so quickly. Um, obviously, there's a lot of tarmac areas, a lot of uh, hard surfaces, roofs and everything. Um, but something that's becoming increasingly more popular in housing developments, and you can also retrofit these as well, are rain gardens. So this is just a way of slowing the water down. Um, so utilising the water uh, before it goes into, into, the, into the sewage system, essentially and into the drains so it's just keeping that water back so it flows through the gravel beds and the plants um, rather than just going straight in so up until this point we've, we've been quite active um, and you could argue that we're making a lot of hard work for ourselves when there are organisms out there who can do all this for you um, Darwish Wildlife Trust are hoping to bring beavers back to the county um in the new year 
um, at one of our Willington sites. Um, and they are they are incredible for many, many different reasons. Um, they're habitat engineers and they can do wonders in terms of uh, habitat restoration uh, and uh, flood mitigation as well. So yes, the sooner we can get these back in the catchment, the, the better. And I'm more than happy to have um, questions on them at the end. So one of my biggest passions um, is actually wood in in streams and rivers um it's incredibly important um there there's a there's normally a knee-jerk reaction from the from the environment agency flood risk team to take out anything that is in a river um because it increases flood risk um but in terms of habitat and slowing the flow it's, it's really really important so you can see the photo on the left um where a tree has fallen in it's blocked it on the right blocked the water course on the right so it's forcing water round the left. Um, and this is adding to that habitat mosaic that I spoke about right at the beginning. So whereas that would have just been a, a slow flow of water, it's putting that variability in. So it's depositing um, shingles and stone um, behind the tree in the slower flowing water, and then cleaning the gravels on the left-hand side. And then it's forming this pool, um, at the, the, for, the foreground of the photo. So you tend to get something called riffle pool sequences. Um, which are which support the most amount of invertebrates and therefore fish. Um, so really, really important features. Um, it's important to remember that erosion is a natural process. Um, so I'm not against erosion completely. Um, it, it's, it's incredibly important. So having that balance of erosion and deposition features and allowing your rivers to function like that is, is, is the best. Um, the whole point of river restoration really is to um allowed natural processes to 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 come back um which in in theory sounds <laughs> sounds very easy you just want a river to to behave how it wants to um and my job is to try and is try and make that as easy as possible so you can also see on the picture on the on the on the right hand side that um you can see the branches falling into the river there's lots of things going on underneath the water surface um, so the branches in there trapping lots of vegetation um, and that becomes a really, really good habitat for fish. Um, so it adds protection for the fish, uh, for the smaller fish. So when they emerge from eggs as fry, it's, the fry can um, evade predators in there. So this is why I would argue that fish do live in trees and that trees in a river are incredibly important for, for an ecosystem and a functioning ecosystem. So this is just another example of the, what I said about reinstating natural processes and the value of wood. So a tree a branch has fallen across the water, um, across the river there, uh, and then over the weeks and months, wood has accumulated up behind it. Um, it's trapped a lot of sediment behind it, and then it's forcing this new channel around the other side. And again, it's it's that dynamic aspect that you're that you're after. You want to try and reinstate these natural processes and allow rivers to do what they're doing um, and building on that habitat mosaic as well. So back to this man, Kevin Cosner. Um, I don't know if anyone recognizes this film. Um, so this film is um, uh, called The Field of Dreams. And in this film, um, Kevin Cosner has to um, rebuild a baseball stadium in this maze field to bring back the ghosts of baseball players, which sounds a ridiculous premise, um, and it is, but it, it teaches you a very, very important um, lesson in restoration ecology. Um, he has a lot of these visions, uh, and in these visions he hears this voice, um, and the voice says, build it and they will come, and he does do, and eventually the ghosts of these baseball players do come and play. Um, and this mantra applies to river restoration. If you build it, if you put those things back in place, if you allow natural processes to, to, to come back, animals will find it, invertebrates will find it, plants will colonize. You don't have to do that much. You just have to make the conditions right. Um, I've made it sound very simple. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's the principle behind it. So build it and they will come. And what kind of things are we hoping will still come? Um, osprey, we don't have any osprey breeding in the 
in the uh, in the county. Um, I'd love these projects to come back. And um, there's no reason why they shouldn't. Um, you know, there's 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 great populations in in Scotland. Um, the Rutland Water, um, some of our reservoirs, um, whether it's along the Trent or um, up around Lady Bower, are, are good are good potential habitat. So I'm very much looking forward to, to having these back in the catchment. Um, but these two um, are really, really important for me. So eel on the left and salmon on the right. Um, so both these species have seen huge huge population collapses over the last 30 years um some of them it's been happening steadily for longer because we've put in so many um restrictions and, and barriers and weirs and obstacles for them to migrate either way so salmon they have opposite life cycles so um uh, salmon will breed in fresh water and go out to sea as an adult um, eel are the opposite. So they go over to the Sargasso Sea, which is near the Caribbean, um, to breed. Um, and then they make their way back over here as glass eels and juveniles um, and come into our rivers and feed up um, as adults. Um, and this is why the connection to the wetlands and um, still waters is really, really important as well, because um, they'll spend a lot of their time going through those. Um, getting these back to the catchment is really, really important for me. Um, they, they should be here and there's no reason why they shouldn't. Um, we just need to to make it easier for them. Again, it's the build and they will come mentality. Um, we have salmon in the lower end of the catchment, um, but again, there's too many barriers in the way. So, so we, are, we are looking at a lot of projects trying to get them as high up as the, the catchment as we can. So just an example of this. Um, when I first started this job, I um, had a look at local newspapers um, to see a very reference to, to salmon and uh, in the Derwent, and I came across this one. So this is from the Derbyshire Advertiser in 1922. Um, I'll read it out for you. I should be glad to know if Derbyshire Derwent is or ever has been a river in which salmon have been found. I ask this because I see no reason why this king of fish should not uh, should not should not be known in Derwent and Amber. And at the same time, I doubt if the fish could surmount the weir at Belper. And I'm not aware of a bypass exists at Belper, provided the purpose. I see no reason why the Derwent and Amber are not suitable for salmon runs and spawning in the season. It is a matter of some interest. And then again, this one um, in 1929. So the Matlock Rotary Club discussed at its weekly luncheon the question of whether salmon could be restored to the River Derwent. Councillor Beaumont, chair of the Matlock Council, said there were records of salmon reaching beyond Matlock, but in recent years, owing to river pollution and the extension of factories and industries alongside the river, that fish had entirely disappeared. I think the thing I find most depressing about this is the fact that we're still having these conversations 100 years later. Um, I, you know, Mr. Ratcliffe is right. There is no reason why salmon and uh, salmon shouldn't be in the catchment. We have um, ample habitat. There's really, really good spawning grounds. Um, it's just trying to get them here. Um, and that's down to the weirs. So a lot of this has got to do with our attitude to rivers. So when we look at rivers, I think we look at them as this wonderful stained glass that is um, perfect and created and fixed. That's how it should look like. Um, I disagree. I think our rivers should be a kaleidoscope. They're an incredibly dynamic environment and move around um, and it produces beautiful things and it's constantly changing. So I think if we can switch our mentality from this stained glass window to a kaleidoscope, we'll be in a much better way of, of being able to restore our rivers. And to restore rivers to something that looks like this. So we've kind of forgotten that our rivers should fill a floodplain. Um, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not suggesting take out everything that is in a floodplain and allow the river to go all the way through. Um, but I think, you know, there's a happy median. Um, but rivers should be this um, braided, anastomized channel with lots of smaller channels linking wetlands. It shouldn't just be one big, straight, featureless, you know, channel going all the way through. Um, and we've we've lost most of these from the UK. Um, which is a real shame. You can get them, get them in Europe occasionally um, and the Americas are, are quite good for them. Um, but it'd be great to see this kind of, this channel kind of system back in the UK. 
Okay, future threats. I'll be quick as I can with this. Um, so future invasive species and diseases, um, increased pollution and urbanization and climate change are, are the, probably the, the three biggest um, categories. Um, so future invasive species and diseases. Uh, this photo is a picture of um, uh, ash trees affected with ash dieback. You know, a few years ago, this wasn't an issue and now it can potentially wipe out some of the um, most tree-lined valleys in the Y Valley, um, which has serious ramifications on water quality as well. Um, a lot of the a lot of the time we we you know we, we don't really see this as coming, um, and it's how we adapt to it that's going to be really really important. So in terms of pollution, um, plastics had a had a uh, been in the news an awful awful lot. Um, it's on the increase, and with that increased awareness, um, it's good to see that uh, you know to some extent it is being addressed. But I think we still have an awful awful long way to go. Um, on plastic pollution um, and again I think we'll be seeing a legacy of it as we did for coal mining um, in our rivers for, for an awful long time. So the last one was, was large plastics but obviously microplastics have also been in the in the news over the past well, couple of years and the worrying thing about this is that we don't really know the effect that this will have in the long term or even the short term. We know it's there and we know that it's in a, in a high concentration. So, for example, um, so Steve, Steve Ormerod, the, the tweet on the left, is a, is a um, lecturer at Cardiff University, one of my old lecturers at Cardiff University. Um, and they did a study that found um, the, the, well, almost all of 55 shore crabs and 37 mitten crabs from the Thames were contaminated by plastics in their stomachs. And then it's happening in the rural um, areas as well. So 50%. Um, of invertebrates in a study in South Wales found my, microplastics and this has knock-on effects and bioaccumulation effects through the through the um, trophic cascade as well um, but again this is it's all relatively new and we, we still don't quite know the impact this is going to have. There are positives um, so I wanted to I wanted to pick this one out as a positive so this is um, a scheme in uh, Amsterdam um, uh, by the Recycled Island Foundation so these uh, flotillas on the left um, capture all the plastic floating down the rivers in these pontoons and then these pon the other plastic is then melted down and on the right it forms these floating islands um, which it has as uh, recreational spaces and it's called the well, floating island foundation so you can have these floating parks um, which I think is brilliant like such an innovative way of, of dealing with it um, and it allows people to connect more with the river as well, which again is things really, really important. Just an example about how quickly this kind of stuff moves. Um, so there was a report in the Guardian last week, week before, um, about pet flea treatments poisoning rivers. Um, and this was one study um, uh, done by a guy called Dave Goulson, amongst others. But again, I mean, six months ago this wasn't no one really had an idea this was happening um and it's the use of chemicals that have been banned in in farming for an awful long time but still persist as flea treatments in unbelievably high concentrations um and it's bound to be having an effect on invertebrates we're just getting a handle on that now and that's a threat that we didn't really see coming um and obviously the, the one on the right um is a reference to to how much raw sewage is coming into our rivers there's still a lot going in there and there's still an awful lot water companies can do to address this and it's it's um they are they're, they're becoming increasingly more aware of their responsibilities um but it's it's a it's a long road ahead so with with climate change um one of the um predictions from climate change is an increase of climatic extremes so increase increased rainfall events and increased drought this is going to have a huge, huge impact on our rivers. So this is um, the River Derwent at Cromford last year, about this time last year. Um, as you can see, there's a man-made levee on the right-hand side, which is protecting this lovely um, sheep grazed area, um, this val valuable sheep grazed area. Um, and I, I can't remember exactly how many homes were flooded um, at the River Derwent last year, but you know, this, this might be one of the reasons why. Um, so again, it's that importance of um, how we manage the catchment is only going to become more and more important 
um, as the, the threats from climate change um, uh, start to permeate through. So one of the things you can do to, to kind of um, adapt the catchment to um, cope with the flooding is natural flood management. And this is kind of, it's kind of, it should all be obvious stuff. You don't have to, our, our, our attitude towards flooding so far has normally been build walls higher, um, get water as quick as you come through onto the next person, which, which it doesn't deal with the issue of flooding. It makes it someone else's problem. You're not dealing with how the water gets there. Um, it's much, much easier to control flooding by keeping water on the land. Um, controlling water on the land is much easier than controlling it in the river. Once it's in the river, it's incredibly difficult to, to hold it back. So trying to keep water on the land as much as possible is really, really important. Um, so on the left hand side, you can see um, the importance of just making a habitat more rough. So allowing water not to run off it as, as quickly as possible. So increasing the amount of time it takes for water to from when it hits the ground to get into a river and this kind of all starts with our uplands as well so our uplands in that top right hand picture they were um drained they were all, all, these big gullies were put through them to try and drain it as much as possible and to dry it out um which is the opposite of what we should be doing so there's there's great organizations like malls for the future um and national trust are doing some great jobs blocking up these um these gullies and allowing water to to accumulate and allowing the sphagnum moss which is really really important um to build up again another stuff you can do um at the bottom right hand picture this is um called a leaky log dam um before you say i thought you said well, we're bad and we should be taking them out yes they are um but the important thing to notice about this is that it's undershot so under normal conditions water can flow underneath it this only kicks into action under high flows. So as the water starts increasing, it hits the hits the wood and start dissipating out to the to the sides. Um, so trying to slow that water down as much as possible. So this is this is a pun I was particularly proud of um, when I was doing this talk. Um, so what's good for the goose is good for the meander. Um, if you make things good for the for the environment so in terms of flood risk and anything like that biodiversity will just explode on the back of it if you start planting trees to to cope with a, a wide range of issues whether that's carbon sequestration um uh, yeah flooding anything like that animals will, will will adapt to it and they'll come in and they'll make the most of it and you'll see these huge gains in biodiversity that that, that we really need across the county and nationally to be fair and this kind of brings me on to, to a big push that we're having at the, at, the, at the wildlife trust at the minute um so we are um part of a number of organizations building on these nature recovery networks and and pushing for a wild britain um so having it's basically working on the lawton principle of um bigger better and more joined up so what areas we have we want to expand them um we want to make them better quality and we want to join them up. And it doesn't have to be just a series of um, protected sites. They can be um, green spaces wherever, whether that's you know someone's street, um, as that as that um, underground -esque schematic shows on the top. It's all linked, and building those um, map of networks is, is really important. And this is where I think rivers play a really key part in this. Um, they act as these really important corridors linking these habitats. Um, so I only think rivers are going to be more and more important the more we go on. This was another one, uh, another pun I was very happy with. Um, so the future's bright, the past was orange. So this, I, 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 as well as paddling around in rivers as a child, um, I've always been into fishing. Um, I live in Sheffield and this is the River Don. Um, so this is me fishing for grayling on the River Don. Um, 30 years ago, uh, the height of uh, the steelworks, um, the River Don was, was orange from the amount of chemicals that were being put in from the steelworks. Um, there was nothing in it. It was, it was very, very warm to a point where there are still fig trees growing along um, the banks um, in the city centre now as a legacy of that. Um, a consequence of that is that no one fished it. So the council got the rights to it. Um, and they still own the rights. 
and it's still free fishing. Um, it's now got salmon up to the city centre. Um, it's that, that section there is chock full of grayling and trout and there's loads of invertebrates, there's dipper going up and down. It's been an incredible transformation. There's been a lot of organisations working incredibly hard. Um, Don Catchman Rivers Trust have done an incredible job removing barriers and getting uh, salmon back um, to Sheffield. Um, there are so many positive stories. Um, so recovery is possible. Um, it just goes to, to show what you can do when you, when you stop polluting rivers um, and you allow them to be connected up. It's, it's wonderful. Um, and it's a great space to get people out. It's free fishing. There aren't many rivers that are free fishing. So you can just take people down there um, for a couple of hours and get them interested. Um, it's really, really important. And this kind of brings me full circle, really. So this is uh, me on a standard standard weekend walk. Um, and this is my three-year-old daughter, Erin. Um, she is <laughs> she's very much her father's daughter um, and is very, very good at weir removal with me. Um, and also her invertebrate identification is very, very good. Um, I asked her what she was drawing the other day and she said a caddisfly. It didn't look like a caddisfly, but she assured me it was a caddisfly. Um, it's kind of coming, what, coming back to what I was saying right at the start about how access is so important. If you've got kids, grandkids, nephews and nieces, there are so many wonderful spots in Derbyshire to take them out and to explore uh, and to get them involved. Um, yeah it's for, for me it's it's you know it's that next generation thing um the more you can get people to care about the rivers the more of an interest they'll, they'll take in it um i mean i'm not expecting erin to grow up being a rivers ecologist but just having that appreciation of it knowing what a river should look like what it should sound like um is really really important um so yeah i'd, I'd like to finish on that if that's all right oh Scott, thank you so much for a wonderfully entertaining talk, but also a really informative talk. And um, we've just sat here taking it all in, um, puns and all. Um, <laughs> no, thank you for that. Um, right, um, questions. Um, not quite sure how we're going to manage this, Scott. Do, do you want to um, sort of see who, who waves at you and who are mutes and, and, and pick people to, to take questions from? Um, it cuts out the, the middle person. If okay, I'm... yeah, that's fine. Uh, Sue Jones. Can you tell us if um, Brook Lamprey are back around Carver area? Uh, they used to be there before the um, spillage that occurred. And I believe, you know, they, I don't know whether they're there now or not. We saw them before that. And I'm going back quite a few years they they are um i don't think they're they are in as high a number as they were uh -huh. um but but they they are they are around carver good thank you yeah. that's right it's good to know hmm. um uh, rachel <laughs> it's dave it's dave, dave. <laughs> yeah. thanks scott yeah excellent talk so I was you. interested in the thing about access because I recently read Nick Cayley's uh, wonderful book, The Book of Trespass. Yeah. Talked very much about the problem of lack of access, not just to public land, but to rivers and this astonishing figure where generally throughout England, we only have access to 3% of our river's lengths, I believe he said. Yeah. Now, I don't know if that's the case in Derbyshire, but does this sort of raise issues as how we get access, not just for enjoyment, but to monitor what's going on to see what abuses are taking place, which uh, are still taking place with farm runoff, with industrial pollution, etc. I, I think you're absolutely right. Um, I think rivers do suffer from out of sight, out of mind a lot of the time, especially because, again, a lot of that stuff can be hidden underwater, like literally hidden underwater. Um, the more people that are out and can see any issues and report back on them, for me, is incredibly important. Um, as long as the access is is responsible, I have I have no issue with it at all. Um, I don't think people should have a monopoly on access. Um, there are, I mean, it's it is a, it's a national debate at the minute in terms of 
mm. um, open access. Who owns a river? Who owns the water? Is it just to the river bed? Um, it, it's a very heated debate. Um, I think both sides have um, valid points, whether that's in terms of safety um, or like, like you said, the fact that you, it's very difficult to access a lot of our blue space. Um, I think we could be an awful lot better at it, um, but I think it's going to take some kind of big legis legislative changes um, that I would I, I would like to see because I think the more, like I said to start off with, I think the more people that have access to it, the more people will care, and the better our rivers will get through education, um, which I think is the is the most important bit. Yeah. Thanks. Um, Patricia Thompson. Yes, um, we have um, a river, it's part of the Y that runs through the Pavilion Gardens in Buxton. Yes. And whenever um, there's a lot of rain on the moors, a lot of iron oxide is washed down in, into the river through the gardens, which turns the gardens yellow or orange. Now, um, it only happens when you know, there's a lot of rain on the moors. Now, is this iron oxide in the water actually dangerous to wildlife? Um, not, not necessarily. So you kind of get, you kind of get that um, ochring overlay. So when you see, um, you, you kind of see it when some streams come in and then you get like all this, this everything looks covered with orange. Um, so that's called ochring, which is, is natural. Doesn't do too much damage to the water quality, but it does, um, it does affect the invertebrate. Well, the invertebrates and fish can't really use the substrate as, as well as they could um, if it wasn't there. Um, it's quite difficult to address, um, but in general, the iron oxide isn't isn't too bad. Um, mm -hmm. Again, it's it's the expense of addressing it. Um, so the, the the cost benefit stuff isn't does, doesn't weigh too too well in its in its favour. Does that make sense? That's fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, Andy Cooper. Hello. Um, I'm increasingly aware of combined sewers discharging, particularly into the Goit, but other places. Are there any initiatives to actually modernise our infrastructure to stop this happening? So there is a um, there's a bill that's being. Um, discussed at the minute uh, sewage and water bill um, where they are they're, they're making sure that water companies are aware that their CSOs will have to be addressed um, so it, it is going through the legislation whether that whether that goes ahead is a different matter and again they're not going to be in any rush to fix it because it's a huge huge undertaking um, yeah, I mean, when when these kind of systems were built, they were fit for purpose then. But in terms of the amount of um, added capacity, whether that's through surface water runoff or housing connections, mm. it's just gone through the roof, mm. and they're no longer fit for purpose. But they mm. cost an awful lot to try and redo. Um, so yes, there are there are initiatives to go um, to just to try and address them, and there are more groups holding these water companies accountable as well. Um, which again is down to the access and people seeing it and people saying, well, that's not acceptable. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I, I am hopeful about it, but they are, along with Weirs, my, my biggest, my biggest bug there. Um, yes, but I, I, I hope, to, I hope they are going to get addressed soon. Thank you. No worries. Um, John. Hello. Hi. Thank you. Um, I just wondered whether there had been any attempts to address the impact of lime waste, um, because a lot of lime, historic lime waste deposits are particularly around Buxton, and they often find their way into watercourses, where I imagine they're, they're pretty disastrous. There's one near, near us where the pH has been measured as 13 at so, so, sometimes, and obviously it depends on the rainfall, but yeah. um, often the water turns milky. With kind of lime deposits. Yeah. I wonder whether anything can be done or has any any attempts have been made to, to rectify that? Um not as not as far as I know. Um because as you said, it, it's 
it's it's very very difficult to address. Um, I, I, it, it is going to be having quite a big effect on the water courses, um, but I think what it's got in its favour is the fact that it is it's quite ephemeral in nature, so it'll just flush through quite quickly. Um, it, it doesn't have that much of a legacy effect. Um, that said, if it's if it's a repeat, say if it's a limestone quarry, for example, that is repeatedly discharging, um, you know, uh, um, high pH water into the rivers, um, the EA will have a handle on it. Um, so ultimately, the, the, the Environment Agency are, are policing our rivers. Um, they could do with more funding <laughs> um, to be able to have the people out there to police them better. Um, you know, we've, we've got things in place like farming rules for water. Um, so a lot, of the, a lot of the agricultural issues shouldn't be an issue because there are rules there. Um, but that they don't have currently have don't have the resources to be able to police it as well as they I think they should be able to, and the same with with issues from like limestone, um, yeah. So so I think so to summarise, <laughs> uh, it is an issue, um, but I think if it's a chronic issue, then the EA will will have a handle on it. Um, Jill Williamson. Quite a lot of the rivers in Derbyshire are in the limestone area and parts of their courses are underground, either permanently or intermittently. With climate change and surges of rainfall and storms, is there any likelihood that the underground configuration may be changed through collapses of structure, causing re-emergencies to happen in different places? Yeah, I, yes, yeah. Um, I think, I mean, I mean, that kind of stuff does happen naturally anyway. I think things will be exacerbated. Um, I think you only have to look at the effect that some of the softs have had to, to see how, how, how much that can change um, uh, the, the dynamics of a, of a water system and the hydrology of it. Um, so I'd say, yes, there, there is potential for that to happen. Um, but again, I imagine it'll be quite difficult to model the specific effect because we still struggle, even in, currently, modeling how, where the water goes. Um, the catchment, the limestone catchment is really, really interesting because it's not just a case of, say, if you've got your hill, you've got your river at the bottom, if water falls on there, on limestone, it doesn't necessarily end up in that river. It can percolate all the way through and come to a different river the other side. So the hydrology is really, really interesting in the White Peak. Um, which makes it difficult to, to pinpoint issues as well. Um, but yeah, I, th I think there, there will be, there is potential for, for climate change to, to impact through that way, through collapse of um, uh, current features to, to force water in different areas, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, da, 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 da. Can I see any other hands? I'm going to say Vice, W-I-E-S. Hi Scott, yes that's right, it's, uh, no, it's not, a, not an English name. Um, thank you so much for your talk, I've really really enjoyed it, I found it very interesting. Um, now, I don't know if you're going to, if this is going to be controversial, but I'm a, a wild swimmer um, and I don't know how you feel about it. I, we're, we're in a group and we're very respectful on on the environment and we always do litter picking around where we go and uh, be very careful where we go into the rivers um, but my question is really what you think of it and especially the river Derwent whether you feel it's safe to swim in um, I I'm completely supportive of wild swimming oh, good. Um, so long as it is done responsibly with access permissions in place I think you, you know, it's the same with anything. I, I wouldn't, personally, on a work level, I wouldn't encourage trespassing um, to, to, to access a river. Um, so, yes, if I mean, I, there's, there's some lovely, lovely spots on the Derwent for wild swimming, um, and I, I, I go relatively regularly um, and, in, and enjoy doing it. I think the need to be able to have those spaces, especially now, 
in the current climate we're in to relax and just have some calm is really really important um and if people have that doing well swimming then brilliant um you know some people have that through fishing i, I enjoy it through fishing i can go out and feel very very calm for a few hours um but i think it's really important in terms of water quality in the river derwent the higher up the catchment you go the better um there are maps so the, you probably know this already but the rivers trust have got maps on um combined sewer overflows and um sewage treatment works um so you can pick better areas to go swimming in than others um and at all times i would avoid high flows because of not only because you know quick quicker water um but the increased risk of there essentially being raw sewage in there mm. um, so pick your time pick your space um but 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 keep doing it okay thank you very much sorry uh rachel again no it's not again it was dave sorry sorry <laughs> i'm not forgiving it and and i'm just i'm really interested scott in what we can do to help with this at, at an individual level but also what we might be expecting and bearing in mind the the wet gardens what we might be able to expect our planning departments in our local authorities to be doing and so on a personal level and from a planning point of view, what, what can we or should we be doing to help with rivers? Um, so on a personal level, there are things that you can look at in terms of um, plastic usage. Um, whether that's how your uh, washing machine is hooked up. So a lot of the microplastics come through um, dish, um, washing machines. So taking fibres off your clothes and then putting them into the water course. You can get... Um, uh, devices that will capture that plastic before it goes into the rivers. So that's that's a good start in terms of plastics. Um, water usage in general, uh, you know, um, my grandparents are incredibly frugal with water. They they essentially still think it's it's the war. Um, and you know, when they have shower, they will turn the wa water off. Will get themselves wet, turn the water off. I think it's called navy shower, and get themselves lathered up. So it's things like just water usage. Is, is really important so think about how well you use your water um making sure that your um uh how, yeah water usage in the garden as well how your house drains is really important um and then in terms of i suppose the wider stuff oh personally as well you can also hold people accountable so like i said by going accessing stuff um the Rivers Trust did a quite a good um, campaign recently called the Misconnection Campaign. So these are where um, wastewater goes straight into a river rather than goes to the treatment works. And you can, they, they called it an outfall safari. So you can walk your river stretch and you can note all these points and you can map them and therefore start building a picture about where the issues are. So those kind of schemes are really, really important to get involved in. Um, what else? In terms of a planning perspective, so our planners will generally have a pretty good handle on any potential issue for a water course. Um, I've, I've commented on quite a few myself. I think SUD schemes, so sustainable urban drainage schemes and new housing estates are incredibly important. Um, the issues come where companies and housing developments would rather because they can get more money from putting more houses on a plot the sud schemes tend to be like big trapezoidal pits which aren't good for anyone um there's some great schemes in sheffield where they actually make them a feature um and make it a better place to live by having these wetland not necessarily wetland environments but these ephemeral ponds that are allowed to fill up with water and drain drain away um they're really important. They're few and far between, but they're, they're important. Um, so yeah, keeping a handle on that kind of stuff is again, really, really good. But the, the, you know, it's the kind of stuff that planners should be doing anyway. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, I'm just gonna flick through the sea of faces to see if I can see any more hands, which I can't. I think you've got one, Eric Thompson.
Oh, Eric, you're still on mute. Gosh, in, in, in the high peak for the last few years, every single planning application is copied to Nestle. Now that's done to protect their investment in this area. And it's a continuing now. How long it's going to go for? I've no idea. But they, they, they will even get copied, like the Buckingham Hotel, um, where they, the client wanted to dig down considerably into, into the ground. They obviously got copied and they were a, a severe objection to that planning application. Now, are there certain parts of the River Durham that are so important to you? You could benefit by actually gaining copies of the planning applications within, say, two miles of the, the river itself. Um, so the re I think the reason why Nestle are so... Sensitive. Um, it, it's been they're, they're protecting their resource, essentially. And it's going back to what I was saying about the, um, how water permeates through the limestone um, yeah. and goes into the aquifers that, that Nestle then abstract from. Yeah. Um, it's the, you still don't really know. It's a lot more clear cut over on the Derwent um, because we kind of generally know where the water's going. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's, it's a slightly different issue. Um, but yes, they are, they are very, very protective. So we, we wanted to work with them um, to address some um, Japanese knotweed yeah. that they have on one of their sites. Yeah. Um, so the, how, how you address Japanese knotweed is, is stem injecting with, um, with a weed killer. Yeah. Um, and they, they were very, very cautious about us even using um, weed killer so close to their to their aquifer in case it in case it got in so they are they are very very touchy about it um because they've got you know millions of pounds invested into it um and it's based mainly around the hydrology of the, of the white peaks which ironically is the reason why their water is quite good <laughs> um, turning the coin over they recently put a a, a, a pipe work down from uh, cowdale across the fields and then actually drill down underneath the river Y and then up and back across the field several miles in total uh, to the, the new bottling plant. Now, do you get covered of that? Because they, you know, they were so close, they were actually underneath the river Y. So if it was if it's if it's if it's planning developments that have gone on in the Peak District, the Peak District National Park Authority will comment on them um, rather than us. If we 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 will we will get to hear about it if we think there if if there is an issue, um, but it's it's building that evidence base um, is is quite difficult. Yeah. Um, and again, we'd we 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 have worked with them previously, and we are working with them at the minute. Um, we would like to see them investing more in. The reason why they are making an awful lot of money. Um, <laughs> but do, do, do you know what I mean? Though? I mean, I, yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> I'm going. To, I'm going. To, I'm going to stop there because yeah, I'm being professional. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. I think probably we've just about uh, everyone's asked a question. Who's who wanted to? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yeah, Sheila, yes. Well, well, I've got so many questions, but uh, they're all because I'm very angry. <laughs> <laughs> Just quickly. From with, Nestle, with, with, with me? From Nestle to the local authority to, to our wonderful government and DEFRA and, um, you know, with the austerity, so we yeah. haven't got hardly any environmental health officers around, yeah. uh, to the privatisation of the water companies. Uh, to new house building with no where they don't pay anything towards uh, expanding the infrastructure so I do feel um, oh, I, I'm trying to be positive and we are very lucky that we have got so many beautiful rivers around here but even the things like overgrazing on the on the uplands with sheep which is totally unnecessary uh, you know, to slow the water down. And it's such a complex subject um, that e even around here, 
you know, just, just things like the, the organic farm that used to be organic, it's now a monoculture of rare grass. All the grass was treated with herbicide, it was rolled and throttled. Uh, so now the water doesn't run off, it's just a big boggy mess. And the cows are kept inside all the time and they spread stinky raw slurry everywhere and all that washes down into the goit. And, and then the bloke bought Taxel Pond, which was a registered wildlife site some time ago. And it's turned it into a carp fishery. And when I objected to it, it, it turned out that it turned out that even though it was registered wildlife site, there was absolutely no protection for that pond whatsoever. So I just do get a bit, <laughs> just get a bit angry that the, I suppose it all starts with with the, the government, and I don't think they're interested in um, preserving wildlife or in, improving anything. I just think they're a total dead loss. I, I a quick a quick response to that. Um, I'm quietly optimistic about the new Elms scheme, so the latest farming payments. Um, I think that that has the potential to either make or break a lot of our environmental issues, um, specifically water as well. Um, and I think you're right, the, the cuts that have been made to a, a lot of the, um, the public sector have really made things quite difficult environmentally. Um, and it will be great to see that the Environment Bill was pushed through um, th that it was positive um, and that it was willing to commit to some serious gains for wildlife. For It, it, it goes back to what I was saying about the, the you know, goose and the meander again. It's, it's a win-win situation for a lot of people. They just have to try and commit to it. Um, so I'm, I'm, at the minute, cautiously optimistic, um, but it's 2020 and it's not been the year for optimism um but yeah i'm, I'm hoping it'll it'll get better thanks very much Jeff. go and see my mp yet again yes please do okay so on, on that nice positive note scott <laughs> um, can, I, can i say once again a, a really big thank you um if everybody wants to unmute and uh, just give um scott uh, a big round of applause for that wonderful presentation. Thank you very much indeed, Scott. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.